Good morning. Um, today I will be reading um, Mark 14, verses 6, 66 through 72. Here it is. And it talks about um, when Peter disowns Jesus. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servants... One of the servant girls of the highest of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You are also with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said, Peter, said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed, the second time, then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times, and he broke down and wept. Thank you, Javier. Was well, everybody full? It's been a great time to be with family and a great time to get to have a couple of days off and just relax and be able to do some things. And so I hope you've enjoyed this last weekend and just top it all off with a, a day when we can praise God and worship Him, and that's always a great thing. So one of the things that we, we lived in Miami right before moving here, and one of the phrases we would hear all the time was, no, no comprende inglés. And I was like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> no comprende inglés, which means, well, I don't know. But, you know, you had just heard them speaking to someone else right before that. So you know what they're doing, right? So I don't want to deal with you. I don't want to put up with you. I don't understand you. And I think that's what happens a lot. After all, when you talk to your kids and you ask them, why did you do that? What answer do you get? I don't know. <laughs> why did you set the couch on fire? I don't know. Why did you pour jello in the turtle's bowl? I don't know. Well, how do these things even occur to you? I don't know. You know what? <laughs> There's a whole lot of things that that's our excuse for. I don't know. Well, then how does it happen? And we don't want to just say, well, I just felt like it. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see what would happen. And so I think that's one of our main things is being able to look at a situation like that and say, well, I cannot be responsible, right? Because if I don't know and I didn't know any better, and, you know, then I'm not responsible, because as soon as I declare I don't know, then I don't have to have done it. And I can't be blamed for it. And I can't be punished for it. Because I have no clue how it happened. Well, I'm not sure parents will put up with that. Hopefully parents won't put up with that. And I'm sure God doesn't put up with that either. But sometimes that's what we do. We pretend, well, I didn't know you meant that, God. You mean you were talking to me? I didn't really understand that at all. You know, if you just said Terry and called my name when you wrote the Bible, then maybe I would have understood that. But I, you know, I thought you were talking to somebody else. And we do that sometimes. What if we just claim we didn't know? You know, people have expectations. Well, I didn't know you expected that. But we never really asked. We never really investigated. We never really wanted to. And I think that's exactly the situation where we find Peter in the passage that's been read. 
Jesus has been training them, bringing them to this point. This has been a long journey for Peter. Uh, he has gone from being a fisherman and not really an educated person. Now he's having to understand what prophets meant by all of this. He has tried before to talk to Jesus about this process, and it seems like he still really doesn't quite get it. The betrayal or the denial, the betrayal in the garden was one of those that, that scared them all, and they all ran off, and they didn't know what to do. But Peter and John came following behind later, and so John knows how to get into the courtyard, and he gets Peter into the courtyard. So Peter's standing there around the fire, warming himself, trying to look inconspicuous. You always know when you're trying to look inconspicuous, you're pretty jumpy about the whole thing when someone asks you something. And sure enough, the servant girl comes up and says, well, you're one of them, right? You were with him? You know him? And Peter says, the, I don't know. I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand anything you're saying to me. And that's really what it's about because Peter's being accused. And it happens not only with the servant girl, then the servant girl to the bystanders. She says, I think he was one of them. And it, no, it's not me. I don't know. I don't know him. And then the bystander asks him again, aren't you Galilean? And he says, I don't know the man. And he begins even to prove it by cursing and swearing, I don't know him. Now, what does that mean to curse and swear? I know you probably know what that means, but I mean, what does it mean here in this context? Does he just start using profanity? Is that really what this is all about? And he starts with the profanity of saying, well, nobody who talks like this would ever be a follower of Jesus, and so I, can, I will prove it that way. I think it's something more than that. Tim Keller, is, in one of his lessons, has written it this way. And I'm going to get Ashby on you, I guess. <laughs> He says, first of all, the verb stands there by itself. It's not a reflexive verb. A reflexive verb is a verb that basically refers back, even without pronoun, it automatically means he cursed himself. This is not a reflexive verb. If he's cursing himself, it has to actually mean, it has to actually have a pronoun himself in the sentence, and it's not there. The word on himself... But that's what has been read by the NIV translators. Let me back up one so that you'll see. And in, the, in my English Standard Version that I have, certainly you're going to read the words, he cursed himself or brought a curse on himself. Secondly, the verb is a transitive verb. It's not a verb to curse. If you read he cursed, it would mean profanity. And he was just using profanity. But this is the word that has to have an object. It's a transitive verb, and it needs to have an object. And he was cursing someone or something in order to save his skin, and it wasn't him. Who was he cursing? He was cursing Jesus. Why would he curse Jesus? To prove he's not a disciple. And so when you begin to curse your own Lord and Savior... And he brings this curse upon Jesus to prove, I am not his disciple. And I don't know what the exact words were. But we know from other gospels that Jesus then turns and looks at Peter. Just after he's pronounced a curse on Jesus. You know, everybody else is still in the trial phase, but Peter's already decided the judgment. Here he is. No, I'll curse him from here. That's pretty bad. When you're the one who has been following and you don't want anybody else to know about it, he probably thinks it'll be okay. I'll just straighten it out in the morning. I've just got to get through this one night. I've just got to try to understand what's really going on here. How, how did all this happen? We tried so much to avoid this cross. I know people have been upset. I don't want people to be upset. I don't know why this is going on. And so I don't know. And I don't know what to do about it. And so I'm going to react in a way that says I'm not part of this. 
And what it really comes down to is he starts by claiming ignorance. And when that doesn't work, he gets all the way to where he says a curse on Jesus and who Jesus is. Certainly not son of God, someone going to hell. He's cursing the very son of God. You see, we don't take God serious. I think a lot of times that's what happens. We, we don't know. I didn't know you were talking to me, God, so I don't want to take things serious. Now, we might other things. If you, do you follow the traffic laws at all? I mean, I don't know if you do or not. The next question is, how many tickets do you have? So if you don't follow them at all, then, you know, you, it, it's very expensive to be able to do that and just drive as fast as you want and not stop anywhere and turn wherever you want from any lane that you want. Uh, yeah, that's what happened in Miami as well. It was fun. But uh, here you can't do that. And so there are traffic laws. If you try to defy some of those kinds of laws, it doesn't work. If you defy laws of gravity, then you can just walk right out and just keep right on walking, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm glad I didn't end up in your lap. <laughs> well, it should have worked. I was just going to walk out, and why did I fall? Gravity. But gravity doesn't work every time, does it? it do you always fall down? I mean, <laughs> every time? <laughs> Who knew? Is God as serious as gravity? Yeah, we kind of respect that one. We know gravity is a principle, and it's a law that it's always going to be there. God made it. He's just as serious about all the other ones. And if you want to just not have gravity and decide, well, you know what, gravity? I just don't even believe in you anymore. Does it make things go better? No, not at all. You're going to end up on the floor a lot of times. And I think that's what happens to us is because we, do, we try to decide for ourselves, this is not what I want. I don't want it to be this way. And so we can just deny that it exists. And that's what we do with God. And we end up here with people pointing at us. Aren't you one of them? And we have to prove that we're not. See, here's the real problem, is we claim, I don't understand, but that's not it. The end of the phrase is, and I'm not going to learn. I refuse to know anything else. I don't understand now, and I'm not going to learn anything else about this. Not even in danger. I just don't want to. How do you claim ignorance with God? With all of the Bibles in the world and all of the churches and all of the people, how can you say, well, I just don't know anything about that? I didn't know what you expected of me, God. Well, it leads you to this. The rooster crows. And Peter can't undo it. There's no way he can get around it. When he finally realized what he said and what that meant, he broke down and he cries. That doesn't happen with men. But I think that's when he understood. And all of the last three years comes rushing back on him. And all of the last time that he's been able to teach or tried to teach. And, and he realizes, no, I, you know, I've just denied my own, my own existence and what I was here for. No, he understands. This is what it means. How did we even know about Peter's denial? If you had denied Jesus this week, would you tell somebody? Would you just walk in? That's the first thing I want to tell everybody. I denied Jesus. You know, usually we don't announce those kind of things. We don't want to let everybody know about those things. And so... And I'm not sure anybody else standing around the fire would have reported him. I'm not sure any early Christians would have reported him. 
I mean, here's the leader in the church, after all. He's one of the guys who's at the top. He's one of those guys that, that I think Peter did it himself. He says, you know what? This is what happened. And I denied my own Savior. I denied that I even knew him. Peter had walked on water. We expect a lot out of a guy who can walk on water, right? Don't we? He even tried to discourage Jesus from the cross, and Jesus turns around and called him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. And I wonder if that's what he was thinking as the rooster crowed. Maybe I am Satan. I stood in his way all this time, and now I... I'm here. I think the one thing that maybe helped Peter more than anything else is he had already told Peter that he was going to. You see, it's just a little bit earlier in Mark 14 and verse 26. It says, and when they had sung a hymn, this is when they were in the upper room, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd of the sheep and the sheep will be scattered But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. It was even prophesied that he would. Does that make it easier, or does that make it harder? Well, maybe it's not quite such a failure if you already knew you were going to do it. And sure enough, you fall right into it. You actually ended up doing the very thing he said you were going to do, and you tried so hard not to do it. I mean, he was the guy with the sword, right? He was ready to defend. Of course, he's not very good with a sword, and so all he got was an ear, but... Doesn't it make it not so much a failure if the person already knew it was going to happen to you? And they're right. Peter has great confidence. I will not. And I don't think we're ever ready for how subtly it comes. It just comes, doesn't it? And we wouldn't, didn't see it coming. It's not an important conversation. It's not an important person. He's just there by a fire. He's trying to take care of Jesus who's over there. And somebody, hap- he doesn't even know this person. Who happens to say, aren't you one of them? No, I'm not. I don't know him. And, I don't. and, and you're just trying to say, shh, quit. I don't want anybody to know I'm here. This is incognito. I'm not letting anybody know what I'm doing. And it's not a doctrinal confession. I don't think he had any intention of that. It's not a statement in front of people. He'd never even see these people again. But that's what I want you to realize is Sometimes when we are out in a place where we don't belong and we are in a situation where we don't know these people, we would never see them again. And they go, well, you're not a Christian, are you? And it's kind of hard to stand up and say, oh, yes, I am, knowing that uh, you're going to get beat to a pulp. Peter's was looking at death. That's pretty hard to do that. And so as you look at all of this that's put together, the denial comes that I even know him. It's the worst night of Jesus' life. And Peter has to add to that. So Jesus turns and he looks at him. Everybody knows it. Also in Luke's gospel, he had told him, and we find this recorded. He said, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that, you might, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And so from the very beginning, as Jesus tells him about it, he tells him about it for one purpose. And that purpose is, Peter, this is going to happen. And it's going to be bad. And then I want you to move on with it. 
I don't want you to be stuck with it, saying that, oh, well, yeah, I'm terrible, I'm awful, I'm horrible. After all the stuff I've done to follow Jesus, after all the miracles I've done, after walking on water, after passing out fish and bread, after all the sermons that I've preached, and now look what I did. I don't think I can ever be forgiven. Have you run into people like that? I have. Have you ever felt that about yourself? And Jesus somehow before this wants to assure him, I know this is going to happen, and I want you to know you can come back, and I want you to know that there's a place for you, there is something to happen for you, and I want you to strengthen your brothers because you're going to know exactly what it's like. You're going to know exactly what they have gone through. And that's what he's trying to do here, is say that you understand what all this is about. Don't make excuses. Do the forgiveness. Be forgiven yourself. Realize that redemption is real. You may have a terrible past, but that's where Peter comes in. You see, Peter's prodigal, right? I mean, it doesn't take as long as the other one. He didn't spend all of the money, but he realizes that, you know what? I've lost it all. But he can come back. He can be a leader in the early church. He can have miracles. He can have God-saving power. He can have grace that changes him. And he realizes that he can. You see, when grace meets guilt, grace wins. And maybe we don't understand how God can love us. We start looking at all the broken pieces in life. And we say, I don't think I'm very lovable. But God does. And that's the end of this whole story, is it could be a story about Peter's failure, but it's not. It's a story about one of the greatest apostles. It's the story where he says, you know what? I want the guy who failed the most and denied he even knew me, to stand up on Pentecost and tell the other people, you know what, you said crucify, I said I don't even know him. Both of us are in a bad situation, both of us denied him, both of us said we don't believe in him, and guess what? Your sins can be taken away, you can be forgiven, you can be part of this church, you can be part of everything that God is trying to do, because that is the very power of grace. It's the point of the message. It's not to point out how much we have failed, but to point out how much God loves and what he is able to do with all of this. And so maybe today you started from way behind. Don't give up. Maybe you made mistakes, and they're your fault. And you realize, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I wish I could say, well, I just didn't know any better. Sometimes we did, didn't we? We really knew what we were getting into. We knew better, and we went ahead and did it anyway, and then now we have the consequences. You see, I think it's only when we know the horrible truth that we can move really past it and go forward. And maybe you feel like your faith might fail. Because we made mistakes and some of them are big. But Jesus said, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Strengthen your brothers. So maybe today, if you have doubts about your forgiveness, maybe you need prayers for you. Because Jesus is able to do that. Prayer is able to do that. If you haven't even made a covenant with him, then make that covenant with him. Repent of your sins, be baptized into Christ. But, you know, sometimes even after that, we've been following, and then all of a sudden, we just do something horrible. We could say, I don't know any better. Or we can say, would you pray for me? Come while we stand and sing.